Hello, RGL 3000 students. Back for our last lecture for the term. You're almost there. Just keep chipping away. All right. So today we're going to be talking about strategies for preventing and mitigating unwanted effects of regulations. And then this afternoon in our Zoom call, we're going to be talking about any last minute questions on your RIAS and on your exam uh, preparation. All right. So let's get started right away on, on this, uh, this lecture, le lesson 12 that deals with strategies for preventing and mitigating unwanted effects of regulations. Uh, some of these topics we've addressed before, but I want to address them in context of mitigating unwanted effects of regulations as they apply to socioeconomic impacts, as opposed to our other course, which is dealing with post-market surveillance. Now, one of the key uh, misunderstandings that a lot of the public has is, is that once you set a regulation, you've developed it carefully, consulted it, and so on, and you've put it into operation and implementation, and that it's fixed in stone. That's actually not true at all. Regulations are constantly under review, and they're, they're reviewed diff systematically, typically on a five-year basis. And there are lots of consolidated regulations, which are amended regulations in Canada's list of regulations, because, uh, you know, uh, uh, amalgamated or modified or amended regulations are quite a common thing. You know, in addition to this, uh, you know, the OECD countries have been developing ways to become more responsive to mitigating un unwanted impacts of regulations. And five principles have emerged in that. One is adapt what they call adaptive regulation. Shift from regulate and forget to a responsive, iterative approach. Okay, regulatory experimentation. Prototype and test new approaches by creating pilot projects. And that's been done recently in areas of guaranteed annual incomes, things like that. There, there's a number of them uh, being conducted throughout OECD countries for different purposes, essentially all the time. Outcome-based regulation, focus on results of performance rather than process. By that we mean what we talked about before in results-based management framework, those new requirements, and recognizing that what matters is how we capture those, those beneficial outcomes and addressing the harm we're after rather than focusing so much on unnecessary reporting or unnecessary uh, uh, considerations within a regulation, okay? Risk-weighted regulation, move from one-size-fits-all regulation to a more flexible situation-adjusted approach. And that's where we're seeing when we talk about regulations being supported by other policy measures. For example, policy measures that would, sm would support small or medium-sized enterprise and adaption to a regulation, whereas the big guys don't need it. Okay, We're seeing that right now in a bit in the COVID-19 response of the federal government, where we're seeing additional support targeted directly to salaries of small and medium-sized business, all right? That's one sort of easy example of that, a current, very current example of that. And then collaborative regulation, align regulation nationally um, and internationally by engaging a broader set of players. And that's the OECD work. That's the stuff we described when we were talking about trade and environment and international standardization. Today I want to talk about two important issues that deal with mitigating unwanted impacts and that is the one on duty to consult and public consultation generally and the other is on performance measurement which we we discussed in the uh, post market surveillance course but I want to go over it in this context. Consultation is a very key issue uh, for not only to, to keep people happy politically as in po regulation is always political but also in regulation design. All right, so that we, we anticipate problems going forward rather than having to respond to them after the fact. Obviously, the old adage goes in environmental policy, people will know that prevention is always better than mitigation. And so public consultation is a very key issue in trying to anticipate and mitigate beforehand any potential uh, regulatory design problems, okay? So a good consultation process assists in developing quality regulations and mitigates implementation risks. But beyond that, public consultation processes are critical to public legitimacy, as we know, which will also have, uh, act to mitigate risks. Because as we've learned before, uh, com voluntary compliance is always better than enforcement. Okay, And public legitimacy is critical to that. 
Okay, the other thing we do, and you're doing it now in your course, is we develop RIAZs. And as you know by now, RIAZs are primarily consultation documents. And that's to facilitate consultation, to anticipate and mitigate any future risks in the quality of the regulation and how it's implemented. All right? And we know that the RIAZ is pre-published in Gazette 1, okay, as a notification document. But primarily the RIAZ is a public consultation document. Okay, and the background, you know, what feeds a RIAS, it might be any number of complex studies, but the RIAS summarizes those, much the way you're summarizing your term papers, findings, okay? Other areas of duty to consult that are really important in Canada, specialized area you should know about it, is Aboriginal peoples. The government of Canada, by, based on Supreme Court decision, has a duty to consult and where appropriate accommodate Aboriginal groups. And so sometimes regulations and the way they're implemented will be modified based on impacts on Aboriginal peoples as well. And the Aboriginal peoples are, are as I say, required by the Supreme Court. The government is required to extensively consult Aboriginal peoples, all right? Uh, there's a common law duty to consult. Section 35 of the Constitution Act, 1982, provides that the existing Aboriginal treaty rights of Aboriginal people of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. In this fact, the Aboriginal peoples of Canada includes the Indian, Inuit, and Métis peoples of Canada, which essentially means regions scattered throughout the country, sea to sea to sea, essentially. Um, so a lot of regulatory developments, particularly in nat natural resource exploitation projects, have to take these these uh, the Aboriginal consultations very seriously. All right, and the Supreme Court decisions um, can be found in this slide with the Haidu and uh, Taku River decisions in in 2004, which essentially has shaped and 2005 essentially shaped the way we are required by law to consult with the Aboriginal peoples to anticipate any impacts that that might ha that regulation might have on them. And so that, that's a really important consideration because we saw the impact of that when Trans Mountain Pipeline was del delayed because of the, the Supreme Court decided that there was inadequate consultation with the Aboriginal peoples and that regulations needed to be created or changed to allow Trans Mountain to proceed. So therefore the courts would have ruled and did rule that there was inadequate consultation with the Aboriginal peoples to anticipate impacts on their communities and on their lands. Good regulation consultations involve recognizing and understanding the multiplicity of stakeholders that can be affected by a regulation, allowing for inputs from different levels of interest, sophistication, and points of view, being open-minded, consistent with regulatory objectives regarding differing expectations concerning the nature and content of a proposed regulation. These are all factors that have to be taken fully into account. And most effective public consultations uh, relationships involve common principles, meaningfulness. Official conducting the consultation should be open to stakeholders' views and opinions. And the courts will look at this. Just because a stakeholder consultation has been held, it doesn't mean that it's adequate to meet stringent duty to consult requirements because the consultation has to be meaningful. You can't present the, consult the stakeholders with a fait accompli. You have to present them with something that actually is under deliberation so that the, con the, the stakeholders can, can actually have an impact. Okay? Openness and balance. All stakeholders, whether uh, directly or indirectly affected, should have an opportunity to con contribute their views. Transparency, the relationship between government regulators and stakeholders should be transparent. In other words, you, you shouldn't be holding separate independent consultations with industry and then doing a more marginal consultation with stakeholders that are NGOs or, or advocacy groups. The, 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 some of these consultations should be open and transparent. Everybody sees the industry views, everybody sees the NGO views, so that the, the process is completely open and transparent and people can react to different positions held by different groups. Accountability. Departments should demonstrate accountability to by documenting how the views of stakeholders were considered during the deployment of the uh, development of the regulations and informing stakeholders on how those views were used. In other words, you can't just receive consultation or input from stakeholders and then not respond to them. You have a, in a duty to consult, you have to have respond. How, I mean, not each individual comment, but when you cluster comments together, let's say there were a, a range of comments that all dealt 
with one particular aspect of the regulation. You can show how that aspect was responded to rather than having to respond to each individual repetitive comment. But nevertheless, you have to show that you responded to the comments, you showed how they were taken into account or they were not taken into account. Okay? And that's why consultations are a very complex process. It may seem simple, you know, throw up a meeting or whatever, do a background paper, and listen to what people say, but no. Good consultation planning is itself an area of business. There are many firms out there that specialize just in that area, as a matter of fact, okay? When I ran my firm, I had, I had a team of three people that were just dedicated to running consultations. That's all they did as part of the business, okay? The consultation plan should describe the issues under review, frame the boundaries of the consultation process, state the objectives of the consultation process, identify key factors that will influence internal and public environment for the consultations, identify key participants, schedule the timelines, clarify the methods, etc. So a lot of the times the team that I had, they would, they would spend time, quite a bit of time, just developing the consultation plan and consulting that with all the key peak organizations to make sure that everybody understood how consultations were going to go forward and how they could make the most valuable contributions to influencing a regulatory outcome. Okay, uh, and it allows and it allows stakeholders to put a, a number of good inputs into the process. And trust me, in, you know, experience that I've had over the last twenty-seven years or so, I've seen cases where, you know, people thought that they had the regulation nailed, uh, but if the consultations, but the consultations ended up showing them some major flaws in their thinking of how people would react to certain dimensions of the regulation, how it would impact social behavior, how it would impact cultural behavior, how it would impact how people using natural resources, these kinds of things. There's so many, comp there's so many complexities, so many tentacles involved that if you don't run solid consultations, you're bound to get into major problems of mitigating unwanted impacts of the regulation down the road, okay? Now, the next major category, of course, is performance measurement. We went through that in the course on post-market surveillance, uh, but we, it's important to reiterate because obviously performance measurement is the way that one identifies uh, factors of a regulation's design and implementation that need to be mitigated because something's not working or something's working too well, perhaps, uh, you know, and, and needs to be balanced off against other concerns in the community. Um, so post uh, performance measurement is now fully integrated into the regulatory life cycle and to the regulatory sign-off requirements in the federal government. Okay, we learned about that. All regulations must be accompanied by a performance measurement and management plan, as you've learned already. And that purpose of that PEMP is to make sure that, that initial policy objectives are, are being followed and that the, the most reasonable um, efforts have been taken to achieve the regulatory objective in, in the, with the least negative impacts on socioeconomics that we could expect would be reasonable. Okay. So the PEMP ensures that the regula regulator has a clear and logical design that ties resources and activities to expected results. Describe the roles and responsibilities of the main players involved in the regulatory proposal. Made sound judgments on how to improve performance on an ongoing basis. Demonstrated accountability and benefits to Canadians. Ensured reliable and timely information. Ensured that the information gathered will effectively support an evaluation and ongoing monitoring. Of the, of the regulatory performance. Now, these are all really important issues seen in context of scarcity and opportunity cost, of course, which you've already learned about. So, uh, regulators should ask, how does this PEMP fit into the Departmental Management Resources and Results Structure? We learned about that. The PEMP should include description and overview of the regulatory proposal, exactly how it's going to impact or anticipate an impact through the logic model, which is a results-based management framework that we've already discussed in the other course, uh, which would include all of the things that you need, you're going to need later on when you monitor the results and evaluate the performance of the regulation. All that needs to be in the pen. You, can't, you don't get to change it three years out. Oh, actually, what we really meant was no. You, the very things that occur in the MEP at the start are the very indicators, measurement, reporting, and valuation strategies you use down the road because the PEMP itself was the baseline and now you're comparing actual results against the baseline. All right? So these are all important issues. Many of them we've discussed in other contexts in our other course. 
but it's important to understand that you know it just just as we plan post market surveillance from the very beginning of receiving a a proposal for a new chemical or whatever the case may be it it goes the same way with regulation we need to anticipate everything from the regulation design back to when it's going to be evaluated or forward to when it's going to be evaluated with a clear plan and that's the way we monitor whether the decisions we took at the beginning were the right decisions and did we get the results we expected. And if we're not getting the results we expected, we need to be able to develop responsive strategies to mitigate, and un- to mitigate unwanted impacts. All right? And that's true from start to finish with, with the development of a regulation. So just as I say in post-market surveillance, that post-market surveillance is not simply after the product has been approved for market. Post-market surveillance is a consideration from the very beginning of regulatory design, all the way through approval of, of, of a product and so on. So uh, that's, that's important to realize. And the same thing goes with, with strategies for mitigating unwanted impacts. You start to anticipate those before the regulation has even been signed off. And how you're going to measure impacts going forward is set and signed off before the regulation itself even appears in Gazette too. And that's good sound uh, management of a regulatory process. All right. So I'm looking forward to talking to everybody this afternoon. Uh, Read the slides and and then we'll get a clear picture this afternoon how we're going to finish up our course and and hopefully uh, everybody's going to be in good shape and, and graduate and we can be very proud of that accomplishment. All right. Talk to you all this afternoon. Take care now. Bye bye.